because you are at the nodal line for the pressure, it's the maximum velocity in the transverse direction. So this, these flames do not have a strong uh, oscillation of heat release, but they are submitted to a very strong wind sideways. And if this wind is very strong, you can get to extinction. So these flames are those which are extinguished because of, you, you blow on them, you know, and, and at a point, if, if your anchoring is, uh, is good, uh, the flames will, will stay there. But if it's not so good, the flames can disappear. And so uh, at very high levels of uh, pressure fluctuation, you get very high levels of velocity and you get this uh, mechanism of uh, blown, uh, blowing away. Uh, there is an analysis of that in, in one of the papers. We, we did some uh, uh, essentially uh, dimensional analysis of this phenomenon and we, co we could draw the, uh, the regions of stability or instability for, for these flames, these particular flames. Yeah. So the flames which respond to, to the, what happens in the chamber are those which bring in uh, the fluctuation in, uh, in heat release. Yes. Okay. So uh, we see that uh, LES becomes a very important tool. Uh, let me just explain why it's difficult to do direct simulation. You see, when you want to calculate a, a turbulent uh, flow field and you have a discrete, uh, uh, you, you've discretized your computational domain, uh, what you need is to if you want to calculate everything, all the scales, you need that at least the size of this, uh, of this cell should be like the Kolmogorov uh, scale. In addition, you need at least to calculate one of the large scale. So let's consider this vortex, which has a large scale L. So the number of points that you have available times delta X should be greater than L. And from these two equations, because you have a, the, the Kolmogorov cascade, you find out that n, so the number of points in one direction, should be greater than the Reynolds number based on, on big L to the three quarter. So uh, if you have a, uh, if you are in three dimensions, this is n and three should be bigger than Reynolds to the nine quarter. So the first condition for fluid mechanics is n cubed should be bigger than the Reynolds number to the ninth quarter here. So for example, if you take a Reynolds number of 10 to the 4, you see it, uh, it gives you a number of points, n3, which should be bigger than 10 to the 9. So a billion points. So you, it's already big, it's really enormous. You know, a billion points to, to take into, uh, into account just to do a calculation at the Reynolds number of uh, 10,000, which is not very large. You have uh, the turbulent flows which are of interest have much larger Reynolds numbers. So, so again, already here it's difficult. The second point is that if you want to do uh, direct simulation for flames, the size of the, the thickness of the flame, you need to have a few, a few cells in the thickness. Otherwise, you do not resolve the flame. And, um, and so delta, the thickness of the flame, should be at least a few times, for example, n is equal to 10. So the, the flame should be should be uh, suitably resolved on your, on your grid. And uh, when, you, uh, when you take a look at that, you find that uh, uh, big N over small N should be bigger than L over delta. And after some little calculations, you can show that big N over small N, the small N is the number of points in your flame. The big N is the number of points in one di direction. This should be bigger than the Reynolds number times the damp color number. So you have this situation now. 
this is a second condition. Should be bigger than the Reynolds number times the Damkeller number. Um, and so, uh, uh, what, what does that do? For example, now flames uh, are characterized by a damp color number which is above one. Otherwise, you, you are not in a, in a flame regime. You are in, in a regime which is more like uh, chemical reactors. So, um, so that will give another condition on the number of uh, points. So let's, for example, say that down color is equal to 10. Um, or let's say, yeah. Uh, what would be easy? Uh, yeah. So if I take, yeah. And, and let's, let's take down color is equal to 10 and Reynolds number is equal to a thousand. So you, you accept to be at a lower uh, value of the Reynolds number, but you have a 10 here. So it makes n over n square bigger than uh, 10 to the 4. And so n, big n over n should be greater than 100. In this particular case, if you say small n is equal to 10, you have the same, uh, in this particular case, you have 10 points in the flame and you have, uh, uh, and you, you just keep the same number n, which is equal to, uh, to uh, uh, 1,000. But, but you see, you've reduced your Reynolds number. You are not able to calculate something like that. You're, you're at lower Reynolds number. You have a reasonable dumb color number. And uh, nevertheless, you need n to be 1,000. So uh, this is why it's difficult. With combustion, it's more difficult to, to do DNS. So th this is uh, explained here. N is equal to 1,000. This gives you 10 to the 9 points. In, in this case, I took N is equal to 20 to resolve the flame. And uh, here the Reynolds number is below 10 to the 4. And here this, this quantity should be below to 2,500. So for example, you can use Reynolds number of 250. So it's much lower than what you could do without uh, combustion. And the damp color should be below 10. So uh, that translates into a diagram like that, where you, you find your regimes. And what, what happens is that you cannot, uh, you cannot reach regions, certain regions, because the Reynolds number will be too high. You see the constant Reynolds numbers are like that. This is what is called a, uh, uh, a boggy diagram or a, well, uh, a, uh, regime diagram for turbulent combustion, uh, for premixed turbulent combustion. So you see here L over delta. This is the size of the large scales divided by the thickness of the flame. And this is uh, the U prime over SL. So it tells you the intensity of turbulence with respect to the burning velocity. And what is uh, accessible with calculations is this region, for example. So this is a limitation. Uh, this, these are two limitations. And, uh, and some, uh, some, some, uh, some regions are, are of interest. You, you don't exactly know what happens here. And you, you, you can scan a lot of things. So DNS allows you to look at uh, many, many interesting problems. All right, but uh, now what we are interested in is this sort of things, and we, we've seen that previously. Whoops, what happened here? Yeah. All right, so let's do it again. What happens?
so here uh, we have this, uh, this uh, th that's a calculation that I showed here. Now we can do DNS. This is DNS. You have the, uh, the flame, which is fully resolved, and you have these uh, perturbations in, uh, in the equivalence ratio, which come on the flame, and which produce velocity changes inside this flame. So this is, this is a DNS. Of course, it's a laminar uh, case. It's not the, so the Reynolds number is small. You can actually calculate something like that. And you can see the, the behavior of the flame in this configuration. So uh, that's a case which is difficult to access experimentally, but which you can access numerically rather in a, in a nice way. This was done by Anne-Laure Birbeau, and these are also calculations that we've seen, which were, were done using DNS. This is just DNS of such flames. Now, LES is interesting because you can, uh, you, you can start working on real systems, rocket engines, uh, uh, internal combustion engines, gas turbines, uh, diesel engines, so, uh, and, the, and the principle of LES is, is the following. In DNS, you calculate all the scales and you resolve the flame. In LES, you calculate only the large scales, the small scales are modeled, these are called subgrid scales. And so you stop, so the spectrum of, uh, of the fluctuations is just this part of the spectrum which is calculated this, this other part is modeled, and you have a certain uh, wave number, uh, uh, cutoff wave number here. And, uh, and the problem in LES is to, okay, you do not resolve all the, the scales. Uh, in particular, the di dissipative scales are not resolved. But in addition, the problem for LES is that the flame is not very well resolved. The, the grid is too crude to resolve the, the flame. So one way to do that is to consider that the flame is a thin front and include the G equation in your LES. So that was the initial way of doing it. The other way is to thicken the flame, make the flame thicker uh, artificially, but keep the, the velocity the same. And this is possible for premix combustion. So you can do that. Another way is to actually spatially filter the flame. So you do a spatial filtering of the flame and uh, this is accommodated on a, uh, on a coarse grid. So uh, uh, this artificial thickening of the flame is based on the idea that by multiplying by a factor F, the, uh, the diffusion coefficient and dividing by a factor F, the reaction coefficient, you have a thicker flame, the same burning velocity. So that's, this was initially uh, developed by O'Rourke and Bracco. Actually, Fred Bracco was a professor here. And they, uh, this was not for LES. They, they, they proposed this method to accommodate flames on coarse grids. And um, later on, we, we reused that. And you see one calculation like that where the flame is thickened. Uh, of course, when you do that, uh, you lose some of the characteristics of the flame. The burning velocity is kept the same, but, uh, but you lose something. You, you, uh, the, its response to perturbations is not quite uh, what it was as, as the flame was thinner. When you thicken the flame, you lose something. Also, what, what you should do is uh, do that only in the region where the uh, reaction takes place, not do it everywhere. So, uh, so, so th this is a typical example of uh, this flame thickening. You, you see these are calculations of, uh, of a flame in a, in a combustor which looks like a, a gas turbine. This is simplified at first, but you can see already that you can represent the flame in this case uh, rather nicely. You, you see this phenomena of uh, having burning uh, uh, reactants that uh, make pockets and burn as, and give products. Now, more recently, 
Now, more recently, we are able to calculate uh, fully three-dimensional swirling flames, including complex chemistry. Uh, it requires a lot of uh, a, a very big, big grid, and you see already 200,000 hours of computer time. And of course, uh, such uh, large times cannot be done on a single processor. You know, the one year is only 8,760 hours. That's all. It's unfortunate. Uh, every hour counts, you know. It's and, uh, but 200,000 hours requires that you put the, the computation on, on many uh, processors. So the additional complexity that we cope with is to have parallel computing, is to do that in a parallel way. And uh, by doing that, you can calculate very nicely, uh, including complex chemistry, uh, using tabulated chemistry or filter tabulated chemistry. This is a model that was proposed by Benoit Fiorina or many other models, whatever you want. Uh, uh, and you, you get some pretty nice uh, representations of the flames. And, uh, and I'm, sure I'm going to show you what we get for ignition. So using these models, using LES in a configuration which looks very much like our configuration. The, uh, and we will compare experiments and calculations. And it fits very nicely. You see, the, uh, this is experiments. This is calculations, experiments and calculations. And you see that uh, this works pretty well. This is work that was done by this whole group of people. Uh, and um, especially the, the, the numerical uh, people are Thomas Schmidt in our lab and uh, uh, Ronan Viclin who are here and uh, Mathieu Boileau, who also did some of the early ignition studies in, in fully uh, uh, annular combustors. And uh, that's a project that was supported by uh, the European community for getting the, you need a million hours to get one calculation, one million hours. So one million hours is already at a high level of uh, resource. And, uh, and we, we've pursued that by going into, uh, into the LES, with the inc including the spray. So this is a calculation with spray done by this lady here, uh, Thea Lancien. And, uh, and the experiments are, are shown here. This is our experiments and these are calculations. It's uh, not as easy to do the calculation with sprays than just uh, in the premixed mode. Uh, let me show you also what we were doing for rocket engines. We, we, we've done a lot of uh, uh, work on, the, um, uh, on what happens when, the, um, when you have transverse mode interacting with the uh, rocket, uh, with, the, with flames uh, under uh, conditions, under rocket-like conditions. So this is a combustor with multiple injectors. And uh, to excite that, we invented this device. This is a very high amplitude modulator. You have a rotating wheel with has, has twos like that, and it blocks the nozzle. Now you have two nozzles here. You see at the end of this combustor, you have two nozzles, and this, this is uh, rotating. So when one nozzle is blocked, the other one is open. And, uh, and like that, you can put in a mode which is transverse. You get the transverse mode. And, and then you watch, uh, everything here is at the pressure of about uh, 60 bars. So it's above the critical pressure of oxygen. This test bench is called mascot. It's, in, uh, it's not very far from, uh, from, uh, from our school, but it's, all this is, uh, was designed by us and uh, brought into this uh, device. And, uh, and of course, you want to do also calculations of that same situation. So you have here five injectors. All of these are, you, you see the grid here, very fine grid when you, you need to represent the, the flames. Uh, you have injectors, liquid oxygen here, gaseous hydrogen here. And uh, the lip is very small, so you need a lot of points even to show the grid because the flame is stabilized very close to the grid, to the lip. 
So this shows typically the amount of uh, nodes and elements that you need. And, uh, and these are the nozzles. So this nozzle is blocked while this one is open, and that one is blocked when this one is, is, uh, is open, and uh, vice versa. And, uh, and this shows uh, the system without, uh, there is no, uh, no acoustics here. It's just uh, the normal development of the jets using LES. So you calculate here uh, the flame. These are five flames. So each of them is different, you see. Uh, and uh, and you, you see the, the group of people required to do uh, these sort of studies because there are experiments, there are calculations as well. Uh, the code is AVBP, but it's a, a real gas uh, version of that code which accommodates these very high pressure situations. You don't use anymore the real, the, the perfect gas um, representation. You need the thermodynamics which describes the oxygen at very high pressure. And uh, for example, the oxygen, when it is injected, uh, is not anymore a liquid. It's a very dense gas. It's a, it's a gas which has a, a density of water and uh, as it, uh, as it proceeds in the chamber, it takes the density of a gas. So it becomes from water, from something like 1,000 kilogram per cubic meter, it becomes 80 kilograms per cubic meter in, this, in the region where combustion takes place. And so this is what is represented. So you, you have very large gradients in density. So that's one difficulty in this calculation. The very large density gradients from 1,000 to uh, uh, about 100. So this is under normal conditions. And what we see experimentally is this is under normal conditions. These are the flames. I'm sorry, the, the image is not too good. And, uh, and when we put the, uh, the VAM under operation and we have a, a very strong uh, pressure fluctuation uh, at one of the resonant frequencies of this uh, chamber, you see the flames are much shorter. Uh, the, the combustion is mo much more compact. And as a consequence, the heat fluxes to the walls are stronger. And, uh, and the question is, is it possible to obtain that? You see, this is without, without the acoustics. And we place the acoustics. This is what, it, uh, what comes out. And uh, indeed, it is possible to actually, this is, these are experimental data on these two uh, microphones, pressure transducers. And this, these are calculated, uh, the calculated modes here in the chamber. And so more or less it fits. It, the, the levels are reasonably well represented. The data uh, has more harmonics, but uh, we get a reasonable representation of the pressure signals. And, uh, and you can see that the, the flames are more compact. Here, it's more symmetric. This is more symmetric, while the, in the experiment, you've seen one side was more uh, affected than the other. Yeah. But, uh, but basically, you, you get, th this is also, th this motion in the transverse direction is seen in the experiment. So, so you see with LES, you can study something really complex. It's a, a high pressure, transcritical, turbulent with acoustics. So you have all these features and uh, you can represent the flames as they, uh, as they are affected by, by the, the transverse acoustic motion. And this is a very strong, very powerful transverse motion. What was? Visualized. Oh, what is visualized is a, uh, is a isosurface of temperature which describes the flame. It's a high temperature isosurface. And uh, it is, to make it a little clearer, we, uh, we color the actual velocity. So the actual, so uh, it's, a, it's a good way to represent, you see the, whoops, what did I do? Yeah. <laughs> I suppressed it. 
Why? Yeah, here it is. It's, it's the, uh, the velocity magnitude, yes. It's, it's a way to, you, you give more uh, relief, you know, you make it more visible by, and, and in addition, it's an additional information. So it's nice to, to have the, the flame isosurface uh, painted uh, by the actual velocity. So <laughs> that's a way. It's nice, you know, when you, when you do these calculations, uh, you have a, an enormous uh, amount of data. We've been data scientists for years, you know. Now you, this makes a big buzz, but we've uh, moved around data for, for many years. Uh, it's not just a new thing. It's uh, for many years we've been working on big data. So, but of course not to, to look for faces or whatever, uh, just to look for something important, yeah. So anyway, so, uh, and, and, uh, and now we, we've been very bold. We, we, we started calculating something which is operational at uh, DLR, uh, a German lab, uh, the aerospace lab in Germany. This is a 42 injector uh, rocket engine operating with hydrogen and oxygen. And uh, so already to do a calculation with 42 injector is very difficult. Uh, it is perhaps not so well discretized, but nevertheless, with doing this calculation, including the dome, including the, all the injection uh, manifolds, everything is there. Uh, all of that is, um, is uh, discretized. The, uh, the lady who did the calculation is uh, uh, Miss Urbano, right here. And it's a, it's a joint effort between Cerfax and our lab. And, uh, and we were able to actually get a, uh, oscillations, instabilities observed experimentally in this combustor. So this is the spectrum that we get from these calculations and these are measured instability. And you see that uh, it matches very much. Now, the spectral density calculated here doesn't have the resolution of the spectral density calculated here. This is why they look a little different. But basically, it's pretty uh, interesting to see that you can get something uh, reasonably explaining again experiment, this complicated experiment. All right, so uh, let's go to the final, uh, unless you have questions here, do you have any remarks? I thought it would be interesting also to tell you a little bit about, uh, about ignition because this is a dynamical phenomenon and, uh, and we observe ignition. And now we, we, we have uh, many tools to, to look at, uh, at that more carefully. For example, how does, you, you see the flame is sweeping the, uh, the injectors. Uh, how, what happens? initially to these injectors. What, uh, what is the dynamics of the flame as the injector is ignited? Uh, is there anything coming out? And you will see it's, it's interesting. It, uh, it's not simple. So, um, so first of all, let's look at some basic things on ignition. Ignition is, is of course, a very important problem in, uh, in combustion. You know that uh, uh, humans were able to master uh, combustion about uh, half a million years ago. So this started civilization. Without that, we were just like animals. We are the only ones to know how to, uh, to, to make fire. And it took a lot of years before uh, people were able to ignite. Uh, so they were able to, to get fire from somewhere and keep it. But afterwards, it took uh, about uh, a few hundred thousand years to learn how to ignite. So this is dated back at uh, about 100,000 years or perhaps 30,000 years. So ignition is much more recent, the technology. But the understanding of ignition is very recent because combustion science uh, really dates back to Lavoisier. Lavoisier was the first to set up the chemistry right. 
previously the theory of combustion was the phlogiston was stupid, you know, was just, uh, uh, it was not explaining anything while Lavoisier made combustion experiments and uh, set up the, the chemistry of combustion. Unfortunately, there was a revolution and you know how he died. He was, uh, uh, how do you call that when? The revolution of Lavoisier. Yeah, this guy was, uh, was a, a very good scientist. Unfortunately, they, they just uh, cut his head. Yeah. Decapitated, yeah. So anyway, the, so combustion science, uh, it dates back to this, uh, uh, it's 300 years, 350 years or something. Okay, so now uh, what about ignition? The first, uh, the simplest uh, ignition system is the following. You, you put a homogeneous combustor here in a, uh, in a, uh, in a plenum, so you, you have fuel oxidizer at a temperature T0. There is no exchange of work or heat with the outside. And then you, you bring the temperature at a sufficient level so that after a while there is ignition and this goes to Tb. And the time of ignition is Ti. So this is really a very basic problem in combustion theory. We can set it up. Uh, I'm not going to derive everything, but just give you the main uh, result of that. It's always important to have such results because they are, uh, they give you uh, an idea of more complicated situations. So uh, let's consider a simple reaction between fuel and oxidizer giving products. Let's assume that this follows Arrhenius kinetics. So you have the, uh, these are the concentrations of fuel, concentration of oxidizer, and here you have the activation energy, the temperature is here. The complexity of combustion comes of course from this term because this exponential term makes it a, a stiff mathematical problem. Uh, the, the beauty of combustion is all also included in that. So these concentrations can be represented in terms of mass fractions. Wf is the, the, molar, the, the, the molar mass of fuel. This is the molar mass of oxidizer. And you can write down these two expressions. So the, the reaction rate can be written as follows. So you have a pre-exponential B here. You have Yo, Yf, the product of these two mass fractions. For engineers, it's better to use mass fractions than concentrations. But the, the physics requires concentrations. And then you have the temperature here. And uh, when you do the analysis, in this case, you get a single equation for the temperature. Only one single equation describes this whole system because it is possible to actually represent the fuel mass fraction uh, exactly in terms of the, temp uh, as a linear function of the temperature. So there is a direct relation between fuel mass fraction, temperature, oxidizer mass fraction, and temperature. So basically you have a single equation to, uh, to solve, which has this term here, this reaction rate term. So that can be integrated numerically very easily. Now we have uh, integrators which accommodate uh, terms of that kind, these exponential terms. You can do also asymptotics. And uh, in fact, if you look at the, at the perturbation in temperature, you can write down an equation for the temperature perturbation here. And you have all these terms which are coming here. And you get here, so this is what is called large activation energy uh, asymptotics. And you, you get an equation where you have basically d by dt of this perturbation in temperature is equal to some sort of coefficient here, exponential of T1 over T0. So uh, this is a uh, straightforward um, equation. And all this term which is here, the inverse of this term is a characteristic time that we will call Ti. So you see the, this is the, this will be the ignition time. This is the ignition time. And how does the, the solution look like? Well, this, this equation can be written like that. And you have a, uh, this behavior for the perturbation in temperature. 
And so at time, when time is equal to Ti, you have an excursion, you see, uh, it's a runaway of the temperature. The temperature runs away and you have ignition. So the ignition is obtained from this, you see the previous expression here, gives you the ignition time. You see that this time is reduced when the temperature is increased. If you have reactants at a higher temperature, this will be smaller and the, the time will be reduced. And you have all the other features right here. This is the heat release in, uh, uh, at constant volume inside this uh, uh, homogeneous reactor. And so here you have just that runaway phenomenon, which is very well described by this theory. So theory, this asymptotic theory, provides a very nice explanation for this runaway phenomenon that takes place, this ignition. And now, uh, the re if you do the, the integration of the equation, the total equation, this is how it looks like. So this is the ignition time, and then you, you get to the temperature, the final bur uh, burning temperature. The temperature of the burned gases is here. So you have this runaway, and then you get to, to that point. All right. Now, ignition in, in practice has many other configurations. For example, uh, some of the early studies that we did was to look at uh, the ignition of such a system. You have three injectors, and uh, sometimes if you have uh, instabilities, uh, one of them can be blown away, like here. So we have a spark plug, three injectors, we inject propane, and there is air coming in. And, uh, and uh, we were just beginning to use laser-induced fluorescence imaging. So this is the setup. You take a laser, transform that into a sheet, shine the sheet through the, through the system you want to image. In this case, it's a single injector, but you can use that for multiple injectors. And you put cameras on the two sides, and you look at uh, various things, and you can look at uh, fluorescence in this case. So this is uh, what happens just after ignition, and then it goes like that, then it goes like here, and afterwards you, you are stabilized, and these are the, uh, the patterns that you get in this situation. So that's a situation after about uh, 15 milliseconds, you are more or less stabilized. So laser-induced fluorescence in this case indicates that at first, you have already some premixtures, so the flame is, is being formed here. Uh, it propagates, so again, uh, you have some premixed uh, uh, stuff that, that burns here, and finally you get this, and finally you get into the non-premixed mode here. And uh, also this was uh, DNS uh, done in the, uh, at the late 80s by Thierry Poinceau. Uh, you start from a point and you, you get the ignition in turbulence. So you see the highly distorted surface uh, that is being produced. And uh, this is the, the calculation that was done by Mathieu Boileau. Uh, now a full combustor being ignited, uh, including uh, two-phase spray, including all the complexity of this flow. Uh, the problem with that calculation is that you cannot compare it except very crudely with experiments. But in our case, we have this uh, combustor. We can really do uh, detailed measurements on this uh, combustor and, and do the calculations as well. So this is what is done here. So let's... Uh, so first of all, uh, th this is how ignition looks like in this combustor. So the flame is developing, uh, makes two arches, and these two arches are, are moving. And uh, little by little, they ignite each of the injectors. Uh, this is at the, whoops, sorry, I don't know why. There is some interaction here. Yeah, and so the flames finally merge. And, uh, and, and, so and after that, the, all the injectors are ignited. 
So all the material goes away, it's being ignited. Let's now, uh, so th this just shows the same process, just in case the film doesn't work, you have the images at various uh, uh, situations. And uh, as I told you, we, we, we did the, the calculations corresponding to this experiment. And you can see here, so this is light emission from the flame, and this is the calculation. Again, it's the isosurface of temperature uh, that is um, colored by the actual velocity. And you see this corresponds to that, this corresponds to this, this corresponds to that. Uh, even s some uh, uh, features are very, very nicely represented here. Uh, we could not repeat these calculations many times. Actually, we did two calculations. So you are not able to, to change your coefficients or do something. You just use the models as they are. You hope that, the, and of course, the calculation is not done in a single, you, you run it for, for a few milliseconds and then uh, look at your solution, it's fine, you continue. But basically, we've done just two calculations. You, you cannot, and, uh, and the calculations match very well. Uh, this is a second calculation, and again, you see there is a very good match between what is measured, what is calculated here. And uh, in terms of uh, the merging time, you see the, what we should do is, is compare. So now the, this is a big problem. If you have cold walls, uh, the, the time it takes is longer. Uh, and, uh, and this doesn't correspond to the boundary conditions that we use in LES. So we have to preheat the walls and this is closer to these boundary conditions. And then you, you see the LES uh, merging time is very close to what is uh, uh, determined experimentally here. Yeah. Uh, this was propane and air. This was in the premixed propane air. And uh, let's, let's see that with a film. Very small, 10 to the minus eight. So it takes a lot of time stepping, yes. It's, uh, it's an explicit uh, code because explicit codes can be very well parallelized. So as you can see, it's really quite, quite close. So you see the time running and on one side, it's just the flame luminosity. On the other side, it's just the, uh, it, it's the calculation. Right. So th this is uh, uh, pretty encouraging. And uh, let me show what happens now when we inject liquid fuel. So now th the idea was to compare propane and, uh, and air premixed and uh, heptane and air and dodecane and air. So we, we compare uh, three situations. One is premixed. The second one is spray, and the third one is spray, but with something which is which uh, which is uh, less easy to evaporate. So you see, of course, the the premixed uh, is first, the second is heptane, and the third is dodecane. So you can actually determine these merging times, you can look at that. And of course, you can then uh, try to, to model that uh, using your, your, your calculation. Uh, let me show it again. All right, and uh, actually the, the calculation was done for heptane. Uh, this is, what is shown here, again, th these are the, the squirreling flames and uh, uh, we, w what we see here is just the volatility impact that, that was in a paper in the, in the Combustion Institute. 
and uh, and then we um, we we look at uh, this injection. So now let's see what happens uh, to a single injector. What what uh, what are the dynamics? Uh, so this shows the detail of the injector, and all of that is actually discretized. So sometimes you have to put uh, a lot of uh, uh, nodes and cells inside these little channels here. Uh, this shows experimental, the spray, how it looks experimentally. So it's a, it's a, um, uh, it, uh, there is a core. Uh, there is a, you see the spray forms a, uh, how do you call that? The, um, it's a, uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> holocone, holocone spray. You see, you, you, you do get that using uh, slices. You can see the, where the spray uh, is and you, you have a holocone. And the, uh, the, the diameter, the sorter mean diameter is about 30, uh, microns in this case. Uh, this shows now the, the light round process. Uh, again, ju just because it's, it's nice. In principle, yes. So you have the two arches. Whoops. So this is the, the ignition. Under spray conditions, there is, in the middle, there is a steel plate. Uh, so it's always appearing there. Okay. Uh, the two archers develop. All right. The camera was, <coughs> this camera was uh, uh, more well resolved, so you, you get more features here. And now we are going to examine how these uh, flame arches ignite each of these injectors. So you, you, you place the camera now on the side and look at what happens to a few injectors, three injectors. And, uh, and this is what, what happens. So the flame is moving here and uh, is lighting successively the injectors here. And what you notice is that, in fact, the flames that are being formed little by little change. You know, the flame moves around, but you notice that there is a change in the, in the flames that are left behind. There is initially, uh, they, they go inside the injector. So there is a, uh, the initial state is that the flame enters the injector, and afterwards it is expelled from the injector and takes a shape which is the established shape. So we studied that. Uh, we, we looked at the various regions here. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's look at uh, some details again here. You see that initially the flames have a different, uh, uh, a different uh, geometry, and then it changes, and it gets to this stabilized case. So this is studied here. Initially, we get this shape A. So this, this, this features here, this is the shape of the flame initially. And at the end of it, it's like that. And if we do the Abel transform, it, you go from somewhere like that, where the flame enters, in fact, this injector. And then it is exhausted and takes more or less an M flame. And you can actually see that in these images. And uh, you can even see that when you look with a standard camera at what happens. At first, you can see that there is a, a foot of the flame entering the injectors. It it's enters there. And, uh, and later on, you have something which is like that, which, uh, which doesn't look like, like that anymore. So during ignition, something happens. So we, we can study that on a single injector. We, we, uh, ignite that injector, and what is seen uh, when we look at the, at the, at the velocity, we, 
here we have the capacity to look at the velocity. We see that the velocity suddenly drops upon in, in, uh, ignition, and then there is an oscillation taking place, and afterwards it stabilizes. So, and this is the, the OH star chemiluminescence of that flame. So definitely there is a dynamics of the injector. So initially it's driven by a drop of the, of the, of, of the velocity. The velocity in the injector drops and then it starts ringing. And uh, this corresponds to this motion that we see. You, you, you start with a flame which, which is like that and finally you stabilize uh, uh, away from the injector. So there is a, a dynamics to look at. And um, why is it so? It's so because when you ignite, you have a, a heat release fluctuation taking place. This produces a pressure pulse. And this pressure pulse can be more or less calculated using that expression of Strelay. So you know the, the level of uh, heat release perturbation and you calculate a pressure pulse, and this induces, uh, this reduce, the, the pressure is increased, it reduces the, the outflow from the injector, and so this corresponds to the reduction in, in velocity, and you can actually calculate the, the pulse in terms of pressure. It's about 2,000 or 3,000 pascals. It's not negligible, so the injector uh, has a, is faced with a higher pressure as a consequence, the velocity diminishes and the flame can get into the injector because the velocity is diminished. And uh, you can write down an equation for this injector. Uh, of course, at the time is too, is too short to explain that equation, but you can write the, the dynamics of this injector and, uh, and the model uh, uh, follows what you see here. You see this is the, the velocity which is diminished and then it starts ringing and you have a, you adjust the frequency and you get something like that. So basically there is a, uh, the injector has a, a dynamics during ignition and it is possible that the flame, because of this pressure pulse, will enter the injector and uh, hopefully you don't want it there. Uh, it is then blown away by, because the velocity gets back to the normal velocity and you, you get that. So, uh, of course, the analysis is a little more, I, I went rather fast on this analysis, just to show you that it's also interesting to look at the dynamics of ignition. Uh, in real devices, this is uh, something uh, that happens, in, uh, that can happen in, uh, in a practical device. The, the flame during the ignition process may enter the injector because you have a pressure pulse which is produced just upon ignition. So that's it. I've, uh, I've covered all the slides, everything. You've uh, been exposed to the whole uh, big number of slides, more or less. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. It's very rewarding. Thank you. Thanks. You're very kind. Thank you. If you were a bullfighter, I'd say you deserve a hoof and ear and a tail. You have heard the lecture by the president of the French Academy of Science. Former president. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, it, it was wonderful to be here and uh, share all that with you. And uh, I hope you, it can help you in what you are doing. So definitely, it was a real Thank pleasure. You Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.